Welcome to the Rich and Success Podcast, the podcast that aims to define exactly what success is to you and helps you implement this into your daily life. Hosted by cousins, actor, singer, and multiple business owner Matt Hall, and ex rugby player, health, well being, and fitness coach Dan Ramsden. Join them on this exciting journey as they unravel the minds of their inspirational guests in a quest of self discovery. Are you ready to take your life to the next level? If so, this is the podcast for you. Now, let today's lesson begin. Welcome back to this episode of the Rich in Success podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Today we have a dear friend of mine, Elroy P. Leon Price. Good to see you, mate. Good to see you. How's dog. it going? Right, mate, the yep. big dog's here. I'm, go- I'm going to kick it off with a story. <coughs> Ooh, story time. Go on. I like a good story. Maybe so it's, it's how we met. So we were about 14, 15. I think we both represented Bradford schools. We kind of knew each other because you were playing for Queensbury, I was playing for Sedgeburg. We kind of had similar friends and, and things like that, but we didn't really know each other. Yeah. And we, we were always a little bit cagey yeah. with each other, like, I don't really know where I stand with this guy okay. kind of thing. And then I got to about 18, 19, and we developed a little bit of a friendship, started to get to know each other. And then Leon's got a grip of me at an house party. He's like, come over here, I want to talk to you. Do you know where I'm going with this? Can't go on. <laughs> so he's thinking, which one is this? So he's got a grip of me and he's like, come here, I want to have a chat with you. And I'm like, I'm like, oh Jesus, what have I done here? So he goes, do you know what, Rama? He went, I wasn't sure about you. He said, but after getting to know you for a little while, you're a top man. I like you. I like you a lot. Oh, what a liar. What a good and liar. And he said, <laughs> Go I've got 98% respect for you. <laughs> so I just started laughing and I went, thanks for that, but where's the other two? Where's the other two? And he went, yeah. that's because you're opposing See You Next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> And then that were it, we were friends ever since, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, we're good. That's a true story, that as well. <laughs> that's just, just sounds like me. <laughs> Say it how it is. But actually getting to know you now, you're not actually a poser. Yeah, you're not. I've, well, I've reined it in, haven't I? No, you're not. A lot. You're not, actually. Still a C-U-N-T. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 still a C next Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's really good for me, Leon, because obviously, Dan, you are my cousin, so you've kind of, I've, I've known of you and known about you and seen you for pretty much most of my life really. It's really good to get the opportunity to sit down. We're going for a beer this time. We're not doing a health podcast no. today. Uh, we're going balance. for, we're going, it's all about balance people. So got a couple of beers, it's really relaxed and basically- the way it, it should be. Yeah, and that's, and that's what we want today. We just wanted to, have, as you, you, know, you and Dan have been good mates for years, we just want to really have a proper chat and let the listeners learn more about you. So. 19 years playing professional rugby. What an incredible career. Is, is there kind of any highlights that stand out for you? Um, there's, there's, there's probably too many to mention to pick out, um, pick out individual ones. You know, got obviously making a debut, playing for your country. Because you were, you were 16, 16 when you... 16, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, playing at Wembley, playing at Old Trafford, Grand Finals, playing for Great Britain, beating Australia. There's, there's ones... There's, there's little things that you tick off all the way through that are, that are fantastic, but yeah. I'd say I'm just the whole experience. I think doing something that you love for your living and getting paid for it and achieving your dream, because my, well, my dream as a kid to play <coughs> professional rugby league, that for me outweighs any single individual yeah. accolade or achievement. Just my, my full career as a whole, because when I were, I'd say from 12, 13, what I've done in my career is exactly what I wanted to do. Yeah. So that's probably the full package rather than individual. And, it, and did it always feel like that was what you was gonna do? Like you just yeah. knew you had that determination, from, this is where you I'd meant say, to be? I'd say from 12 or 13, there was no doubt in my mind that I was gonna play rugby. I was gonna play Super League. I was gonna play for Great Britain. I was gonna win a Lancaster Trophy. <laughs> Uh, that's in my mind it wasn't like a, it wasn't an option and this is not I'm not being arrogant some people can class it as a bit of arrogance but for me it you was just it was just, it was just tunnel vision yeah it was just tunnel vision and it wasn't I, for me there were no other alternative that's what, exactly what would happen yeah that's it and it did and, and it, it did, did. yeah and, yeah. I, and it won it won arrogance and I won't be I want a bit cocky with it but for me that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna play rugby I'm gonna play professional I'm gonna play for Great Britain 
it's not like I wasn't going to do anything else. That's what we're going to do. Do you not think as well, like, a lot of that probably came from you being so young? I feel like when you're younger, you, you do have this confidence that whatever your dreams are, you can go and achieve it. It tends to be only when you get older and peop other people and other circumstances put doubt in your mind. Yeah, they can you douse the flames a little bit, can't they? Yeah. yeah. So maybe part of the, that was, you know... Maybe, yeah. I just think... It is, uh, I don't know, we're not all built the same, are we? That, for, for, for me, I know I was, the, I was the most dedicated in rugby league when I was young. Yeah. I know that there was nothing coming in between me and what I wanted to achieve. If I could have kept that for a longer time, I more, could have done more in my career. Okay. But I had a single-mindedness and, uh, and uh, a drive that were maybe not every all kids have. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, re I remember that very yeah, well. Um, you know, and I can, I can vouch for that because there were many occasions when there were house parties, there were trips away. There were, I mean, we go back a long way. And, you know, there were a lot of social events that Leon missed out on as a kid because, because of his mindset you know, because of what he wanted to achieve. So, you know, there were, back then there were lots of things that, that he missed, but were it worth it? Probably oh, God, well, no, it? I, won't, I won't change it for the world. I won't change, I won't change the ups and I won't change the downs. Yeah. Because that, everything, everything's about building you. Yeah. And I think, when, I think a, a lot of the success we talk about, but what you don't plan is, is, the, is the dark side of it as well, is the downtime. But you've got to go through that to enjoy it again. Yeah, completely. Because when you start, when you start, you're so naive, you're so young, and you think everything, you just think everything's going to keep going that way. You know, 16, make my debut. 17, get young player of the year. 18, play for England against Australia. And then everything's going amazing. And then boom, you drop form. People start slagging you off. People start having a go at you. Yo, you're rubbish. He's got second year syndrome. You know, all these thousands of friends that you somehow accumulated. Yeah. And the, all the bads that are patting you on your back and telling you you're the best player in the world are now telling you that you're shit, that you shouldn't be playing. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that, 18? Yeah. yeah. 18, 18. So you. Yeah, because you just think you you just think everything, You when I started playing, I just thought everything were going to go rosy. Yeah. It's going the way I planned it, it's brilliant, I've had my and debut. people build you up to be People that, don't build you? you up, you know, you're reading, so when you first year, you'll start playing, you're looking, every week you're looking, saying, hey, you're getting 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10, <laughs> man, I'm actually on price, up and coming, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. Gonna be. And you, you never, you, you believe it, you believe it, you, know, you read it and you believe you're on hype. Yeah. The next year, if you can, you're out of form, and things are going the other way. Leon Price, six out of ten, really struggling this season. And you might have played all right, but you believe it. Yeah, yeah. You Words believed it when it was good. You believed it was good, so you yeah. better believe it when it was bad. Yeah. Like it's it's right. Yeah. And then you get to 25, 26, or 23, 24, and you you know whether you play good or bad, you don't read nothing. You just leave it. If you yeah. play good, because these guys that are reading, these guys that are writing you six out of ten, seven out of ten, they've never played a game in their life. <laughs> yeah. What are you what are you what yeah. are you reading it for? Yeah. But also, it's the armchair uh, critics, isn't it, as well that yeah. come up and and the talking shit. Yeah. You know, if they see you out socialising, or even if you're going to pick up a friend and you walk through a place, Wibsey were rife at the time. Yeah, on it. Every, everybody used to congregate in Wibsey, a village just not not far away from Odsall where he played, and I were there with him, um, pretty much through it all, and people coming up and giving him some pretty harsh, harsh words, you know, like. Went on your best today, why you know, just stuff like that. Guys who he's never met before, and he's like, no, I've never been, I, but, I, it, but I've never been good at handling that because for me, it's a personal attack. If for me to come up to speak to you personally, no matter who you are, you've got to, got to be a bit of balance of respect, you know. It's 100%. Got to be, so if you, if you play sport or you're in the limelight or you're in the public eye. You still got to have a manner of respect of how you speak to a person. Oh. So if you're going to come up to me and talk to me like I'm a knobhead, I'm going to respond to you the exact same way. Mm -hmm. That got me in a quite a bit of trouble. Yeah. But people probably don't really want to talk about that. They'd rather say Leon's a knobhead because he's, you know he's very arrogant. Him, That's right? easy though, isn't it? Yeah, it's easy to say that. Yeah. But for an 18, 19 year old kid who was getting some abuse on his out with his mates, I can't, I, can't, I couldn't take it. You know. But also, especially for you, you said there, you were tunnel vision for you. Uh, you know, I presume it was all about the game and, and building up, up to that. You've not had necessarily training in how to deal with members of the no. public and how to do with that negative no. press and stuff like that. You know, no, you're not it's equipped it's at 18, are you? No, you're not equipped at all. And the thing is... Is that something that's ever taught? No, not really. You've got to go through it. It's like, you've got to go through it personally. 
to yeah. get the experience. But at the time that I was coming through, but they were bulls mania, so we, we was at Bradford, Bradford, we all know what Bradford was like, you know, he don't get great press, but we had a really good rugby team. We were getting 17, 18,000, we were going to Wembley, we were at the top of the league, we had a lot of press, it was summer rugby. I'm from Bradford, I'm the only Bradford lad that's in the team. I made my debut at 16, I played half, just got a young player at year at 17. So the hype and the buzz around yeah. rugby was massive. Yeah. It wasn't like rugby, it was like being a football superstar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can go anywhere and you were recognised, which is fantastic when things are going good. Yeah. But then when things go the other way, it becomes just a, a nightmare. So I, I, I become a very cagey. I, I got very cagey, I got rid of everyone. I got me stripped my friends back to just my real close friends who I went to school with. Um, and really put up a massive barrier with people because it, to let people in and to be hurt is far worse than just blocking everyone out mm -hmm. for me. Mm. You know what I mean? From, yeah. from the times that we, when I played and we're going through bad, bad form or people just talking rubbish and giving you shite. I'd rather just not hear it, I'd rather just go, I don't want to talk to you, go there, and then my head's all right. Yeah. But then you, that can, can come across as arrogant. Mm. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, and they want, So it's, it's hard, but you've got to go through that. Then eventually, when you get older, and you realise, you just don't put yourself in that situation. Mm -hmm. If you've played bad, you don't go out. Yeah. But 21, 22, your life is about going yeah, out. 19, it's, isn't it? Yeah. It's not, you're not at home with your family yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Life's about going out, so... You find it yourself as yeah, a human. You are finding yourself you know, you don't, You don't truly know yourself yeah. either at that age. But so it can be damaging, thing, can't it? We're a big thing is that rugby, rugby, when I were coming through, when I were playing and when I were doing OK, was massive, mm. were huge. Mm. It wasn't like it is now, yeah. far bigger. Yeah. So I played, my 18th birthday was on the night of the grand final. And I remember I, were all, I was at home, and because it's been well publicised and what have you, I, I, I'd come down for my birthday and I must have had, I'm not lying, 200 cards. The people from Bradford had just sent me to my house. They yeah. found out my address yeah. and sent me cards, birthday cards. And I'm sat there in bed, I'm thinking, I'm a superstar. Yeah. This yeah, is, yeah. this is, <laughs> I am the man. <laughs> this is normal, this is normal. Like, I, people I don't even know are sending me birthday cards. Yeah, yeah. Like, I am the man. Yeah. You know, and, and I think this is going to happen for the rest of my life. Yeah, of course. Because you don't know any different. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah. getting, I've honestly, I've got, I've got 200 cards. I don't, I don't recall that. You, know, no, you, you never told me that. Oh, no, yeah, no. I've got, I'm at my mum and dad's house. I'm getting ready for the grand final. Two, uh, 1999. And I remember coming downstairs and, and over a couple of days, because it didn't all come on the same day. I must have had 100 cards, 150 cards. <coughs> Is that when cards. you got that tridus allowed? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's what I just thought was going to be normal, yeah. you know, and, 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 and the innocence of that and being everybody talking about you and being the next Bex thing and blah, 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 it's very easy to get caught up in your own, mm. your own hype, and I did, I did, mm. but God, who trained you not, who, who trained you not to? Absolutely, who wouldn't? You know, <laughs> yeah. It takes somebody pretty kind of on it and, and kind of beyond their years, I very, guess, very to much be that years, aware. Very much beyond your years. Completely. To, to be aware of what's going on around you. I mean, I got sucked in with it all, but it was good. Mm. You know, it was, if I look back on it, that year, 99, was the best, best year of my life, like as a player and as a person as well, because you're so innocent, everybody thinks you, you know, everybody's loving you, you're yeah. good media, yeah, yeah. you feel great. Yeah. Do you think people need to be trained in that? As in, do the clubs need to support more players? So someone, someone like yourself that, that that's come through so young and made a, you know, such an early debut. Do you think there needs to be more support networks it and should, things like that? There should be, but I think it's very, very difficult. The best thing that I, I didn't start drink, I didn't drink at all until I probably. Not properly until I was like mid twenties. I'd have a couple of beers here, there, and everywhere. But I want a drinker, so for me, that kept me out of a lot of trouble. Mm. But for these young lads nowadays, most lads, young lads drink. Yeah. So it's the drink. It's the drink around the social area with the pressure, with the limelight. Kind of all the, goes hand in hand. It all goes. Yeah, all fizzes over. And especially now with mobile phones. I mean, if the mobile phones were out about, I might not even be saying now. You know, I mean, the trouble you can get yourself into oh. and stuff to recorded. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it's you know it's it's. it's, it's like back then, it were it were difficult, but God, nowadays, with mobile phones, everything you do gets captured, and you yeah, can get yourself does. in some proper bother. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's funny that I remember even I was listening to a podcast with uh, with Elton John, 
And he was saying back in the day there was him and there were Freddie Mercury and they were going, they were doing all sorts. He says now we just we have dinner parties, we have people around. Yeah. He said I would never go out in public no. and have a drink or, or go out. He was like it's just like a that. different world. I'm not nowhere near like not put class myself <laughs> on his level, but I yeah. I very much seclude myself now. Really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. it's not worth it. Mm. It's not worth it. You go some places and if a bit of bother kicks off and you're there, why are you putting yourself in that situation? Mm. But that's only because you know obviously I'm older and. I can't be bothered. Mm. Yeah. I just can't be bothered being around yeah. it. You've got more to think about, and exactly. you know, you've got, you know, you've got three kids, yeah. you've got a wife, you've got, got 18, 19, going out to your world. Yeah. You're playing rugby, you're winning, and you're going out. It's yeah. that simple. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Good and you're seeing your mates, and you're up in, you're up in forests on a Sunday. It's that simple. You're going. That's what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So your life revolves around going out. Yeah. So it's very hard. To, you, to, for an 18, 19, 20 year old kid to tell him not to go out and have a beer, oh, oh, of not, not to go out. Of course it is. Yeah. Now on that, like one of the things we try and give our listeners is like advice in terms of like business and financial stuff and things like that. Obviously, young age, you're successful, you're in the public eye, you're earning good money. Did you at any point have an eye on the future? Were you good with money? Was it important for you? Like you say, it's a big part, it's just going out, oh, yeah. having a drink. Do you think you had a good a good eye on planning for the future? Yeah, yeah. I started my pension when I was really young. Uh, Invested in some houses, bought four or five houses, got a pension, got some items. I were, I were, yeah, I was really, really conscious of the money that we're earning. I bought a BMW, brand new 30 grand BMW that I shouldn't have done. <laughs> but, but you treat yourself, don't you, I mean? I mean, you're earning, I'm earning 50, 60, 70 grand a year and living at my mum and dad's house with no bills to pay. Mm. Um, you, you, it's a lot of money. Um, but a lot I, of people that just blow it, though, wouldn't they? Yeah, well, I didn't blow it. I no. didn't blow it. Um, and the biggest thing, the biggest reason I didn't blow it is because I didn't drink. Right, okay. I think socialising and spending money and drink and everything else that goes with it can, is an easy way to piss it up against the wall. Mm. All your money. Also, I've got a massive amount of respect for you in terms of. You, you don't need to put that show on for people. No. You don't need bling bling. You don't need to, you know, I've, I've seen you many a time just rock up somewhere in, in your trackies and just, just chilling. And, yeah. and, you know, there were a time I've, t I've told you off, off camera before, um, you know, you used to you used to drive your Yorkshire bus mm. to St. Helens because yeah. you didn't give a shit. No. The Yorkshire bus were a Citroen Picasso. <laughs> they used to, used to pick his teammates up and, um, <laughs> You know, just just a little old beat up thing, but he didn't care. He yeah. didn't care. He, he, he just, was doing just well. He was in good I'll, I'll, perspective. Yeah, you were at like think, the height <coughs> of your career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. the one thing that rugby league teaches you is if you get above yourself, you're gonna get knocked down. Yeah, people won't accept you if you are a jumped up little prick. Yeah, you what the what have you? Yeah. So it keeps you grounded, rugby league, and that's the best thing about rugby. And the reason the reason why rugby league players get in so much trouble is we're all working class. We all come from nothing. And we don't really care. Like we, we don't really want to be the big timers. Because mm. if you're a big timer, you, you you'll get kicked out of a team. Yeah. The lads won't associate with you. You know. You're not accepted. You, you know, you're not accepted no. at all. If you're a big timer, you, you're posing around in really fancy clothes, you're spending a fortune, driving fancy cars. The lads will think you're a prick. Yeah. And, I, and you work that out straight away. So you don't. You do the opposite. You go straight to. Well, I'm nothing. You know, we are all of us. Ah, no. Yeah. And, and then you all get along. And that's how rugby league survives. But because we are so um, working class, and we still hang around with his mates, and we still got pubs with his mates, yeah. can lead you into trouble as well. Because course, yeah. you, you will end up living a life of like your mates, mm. and that's why a lot of people go in trouble because you end up doing what your mates do. Because we're all, you know, we we can go into pubs, we can go into bars, and we don't, you know, we don't think that we're too good to go into a anywhere. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's, it's got it, but you know, you can't be, rugby league, you can't be a big time. You can't be, mm. you, you, lads, what have you. It's that simple. You're gone. Yeah. Now, obviously, you've talked about, you know, kind of the ups and the downs. And obviously, one of the things we want to talk about, if you're happy to, is after you retired and, and sort of, if you just talk us through how your career came to, to an end and, and sort of the years that followed, where, yeah. where it went. So, what were I getting to? Probably 34, 35. I've <coughs> been playing in France for three years. Came back to Hull FC. When I was in my first six, the, or midway through the season, no, sorry, probably about five games left in the season, my first year in Catalan, I injured my knee. My knee locked, my cartilage, cartilage all locked up in my knee. 
So I had to have an operation to remove some meniscus. I had that done. And then from there, really, gradually, slowly, gradually, I never really recovered. My knee was never the same. My, I lost a yard of pace, lost my sidestep a little bit. So we're a bit on a little bit of a, a decline. From then on in, really, I went I had three years at Catalan over in Perpignan, south of France. Went to Hull FC for two years. Probably only did about a year, year the first year half decent. Leg was still just about right. And I signed for Bradford Bulls to come and do one more year. But my knee was just gone. My knee was shot. I was having injection be before the game, an inje injection at half time not being able to walk for three or four days and then just getting back on the same cycle of, of being, having, having an injection, injection before the game, injection at half time, limping for four days, not being able to check, just to keep on going because that's what I do, it's my job yeah. and yeah. this rugby we just keep on going. That's know. something that the fans don't see either. Yeah. So you just do it but for me also is I've got bills to pay so I, I'm not going to say I'm not going to play, I'm playing. I play, do just inject me up and get on with it. Deal with it. Let's go. But you know, if I quit and I retire and I stop and I don't start getting paid, I've got I've still got to pay, find all my outgoings. I've still got to pay my mortgage, still got to pay out bills. So it's a, you put a massive amount of pressure on you, and that's you know, I'm, I'm not looking for um, sympathy because really and truly, you've got enough time to <coughs> set yourself up in other areas mm -hmm. if you want. You know, you know yeah. it's coming to an end, but. You know, in my head, I was never going to retire. You know, we're going to go be a, a coach somewhere else and stuff. So I kept on playing. Cut a long story short, my knee had gone. God, I should never play for Bradford really. My knee had completely gone. I had to got told to retire after a, a game against London Broncos. Fell on floor. But the crowd started booing me. Blah blah blah. Um, and I retired next morning. Mm. So you, your final game, the, the, your your supporters were booing you. Yeah, yeah. Final game, I got. Brought off because I missed a tackle, knee collapsed, walked around the back of Bradford Bulls fans. Not all of them, but you got yeah. you're getting yeah. booze and jeers. Sat down on the bench, started crying, realised that you know you've done you done oh, you've been playing games since you were eight, professionally since you were sixteen, and you're getting booed in your last game, and yeah. your heads your heads all over the place. I was more embarrassed for my wife and my mum and my daughter who were in crowd. I think God, how bad is it? They must feel so bad. Yeah. They yeah. must feel bad because yeah. it was it was bad. So the next day I went to meet the chairman, they agreed that I should retire. That I was still going to get paid for a year, so I'll retire, you'll get paid till the end of the season, mm -hmm. okay. And then the next day after that, oh, I'm just at home every day. So you've gone from being professionally, I've been involved around, I'd say, a good 40 people every single day, every day, to sat on your own. Mm. Can I just say as well, though, you. You were the ball boy at Bradford, yeah. you know, like you were, were part of the life and the soul of that club. Mm. You were involved in so many things in terms of winning medals, mm. um, man at match performances, lots of tries, putting your body online every single week, getting your shoulder dislocated, this and that. I, I mean, I, I remember, I've seen it all, I've been there with you. And for that, I think the I think the fans need to be responsible to know that what kind of damage that can do to somebody, you know, when it when it comes to something like that, because there's still a there's still a person underneath that jersey, yeah, but, yeah, and but, people yeah, need to understand that. Yeah, that but they don't. You, they don't they, as a as a person, <coughs> as a refl as reflecting now, they just sports fickle, and, and all they want is to see their team doing well. And when they see somebody, on all they see and they look on field and say, Leon, it should be good, who's look like a silly old man that needs to retire. They saved me, really, because if, if I'd have had to play the rest of the year, I might have been dead, if I'm honest with you, because I just couldn't do it. I was forcing myself to do it. So then boots yeah, so saved you, So you could have got like worse. more injuries or yeah, whatever. Yeah, they're just worse. Mentally, I, mentally I were dead. You know, I, would, I were gone. I were absolutely petrified of stepping foot on the field. I were like... I've, my biggest thing in life, if I've ever been in trouble, the thing that I love most is playing rugby because it gives me a complete no release. When I step on that field, in my own head, I'm not saying I was, I was the man. Nobody on this field can touch me. I'm going to go on here now. And if you're getting cheered from crowd, and you feel, that gives you the ego boost for that week. You feel great. You feel, don't matter what anybody says. Mm. And then when I got back to Bradford, when I stepped on that field, I was petrified. And that's when I knew it was wrong. I knew it was game over, like I was shitting myself about playing. And to no, make mistakes? Just because I knew I couldn't run. 
Yeah. I couldn't do what I used to be able to do. So, you know, it's the, the booze, you can look at it in two ways, and after be going through what I've gone through, rather than look at, oh, they were wrong out of order, blah, 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 I think, thank you. Thank you very much. You saved me. You made me go to a place and get help. Just look at the goods out of it, look at the positives out of the, the negatives. Yeah, and that, that's that's the key, isn't it? Yeah. That, that's a massive, uh, a massive thing that I've learned from from you now when we have when we have discussions and things like that, and and your state of mind and what you've learned because you you were in a very dark place around that time, mm. and especially retiring as well, um, you know. And now you've got the most gratitude and the most yeah. compassion that I've ever ever seen you have, yeah. and I think it probably comes from being down at the rock bottom yeah it just in terms of how you feel i, I just think um how can i how can i describe how can i describe it? i just think for me that's what i'm gonna say for me and you know this because you know me i was the most single private person in the world and if i had any problems i didn't talk to anybody about nothing i'm talking about my mum i'm talking about carly I didn't speak to anyone, so if, I'm, if I was stressed about rugby or I was stressed about life or bills, I, my mum's really private and I get it from her, I just keep everything in. You know that, yeah. I'll tell you no. Yeah. I don't tell anybody about my relationship, I don't tell anybody about my stress. And I think when I, when I went to rehab, after th th that happened, I started to realise that you've got to talk. You've got to share, your, not, you don't have to be a burden on somebody, but. You know, if you say, if I, if you say to me, like, how are we feeling? I say, I'm a bit stressed at the moment, I'm struggling with a bit of cash. It takes the weight load off it. It doesn't become a burden on your head. And, and I think my problem is, everything that's happened to me during my career all built up. Yeah. From being 16, 17, every single problem and all the stress that I had up to that day, I, 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 never, I never released it. It was just built up back in my body, in my head as a pressure. And yeah, that, was, that was my biggest problem. So when I went crazy and I started drinking every day and going mental, it's because I just couldn't handle it. So what happened then after you've retired? Where, where, where are you at mentally? You've been from going around, being around all these different people to suddenly, presumably, just being pretty much on your own, like you say. Yeah. Where are you at mentally? Yeah, well, and and just, what did you do next? Um, it's just that you just that you, I was just feeling sorry for myself, obviously. Thinking that. All I could think about was, oh, I can't play rugby anymore. And the one thing that I were good at, the one thing that I were good at, I can't do anymore. And you know, it was the one thing that I, I was passionate about. And you just look at all the negatives. Yeah. Yeah. Just. That's all you can yeah, see. Yeah. All you can see, you yeah. can't see wood for the trees. Yeah. Um, you don't, I didn't want to. I didn't really want to be here. I wasn't really bothered about being here. I didn't. I, I wanted to go to sleep as early as I could, so I'd be asleep on couch by seven. Um, and then when I'd wake up in the morning. I just want to go straight back to sleep. I didn't want to be awake because you, then, if you're awake, you're with your own thoughts. Um, and then that moved on to when I was awake, I'd go and get, go to the shop, get a bottle of vodka, or get a couple of bottles of wine, come back home, drink them. And did that become basically the no, routine? No, yeah, you want every day, but no. I had to try and hide it as well because my wife was pregnant at the time. But it was just a form of escapism. I wanted to escape myself. I wanted to. I didn't want to really be in, in the in the world as it was. So, well, presumably, because as you touched on earlier, you can't go many places without people locally knowing who you are. Yeah, can't and go now anywhere. it's a more negative anywhere. response. Yeah, well, it wasn't, it wasn't, a, neg it wasn't, it wasn't a negative response. It wasn't a right, negative okay. response. It's just that, um, you, like you said, you can't, I can't go anywhere. So being behind closed doors for me is safe. Mm. You know, it's like I can take the mask off and have to be a polite and be the person that the public want you to be. You're not yeah. getting judged. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. for me, being behind closed doors, I could just do what I wanted to do uh, and write myself off. What do you think is the worst point? Is there a point that sticks in your head where um, you got? So, um, yeah, it was crazy. So my, when my daughter, I had to pick Lily up from school. And Carla says, whatever you do, make sure you pick her up at quarter past three. And I must have gone to the shop and got a couple of bottles of wine. And then I came home, I necked one and I necked another one. And the next thing I know, Carla's come through the door. Um, it must have been quarter to four. What are you doing? You've not picked Lily up. And I'm like asleep, drunk on couch, just coming around. So I've like, because you're drunk, you like, you start laughing, don't you? you don't care. So yeah, I just yeah. rang a taxi. I said, oh, come pick me up, got a taxi. 
Carla's going mad, she's pregnant at this time, she's what? Oh shit, she would have been six, seven months pregnant. Um, went to my mum's and then carried on there, just went into the fridge there and I must have drunk for two or three days, solid there. Just didn't want to be here. And then I'd go and get bottles of vodka and then by then, my mum realised it was out of control. So I um, rung, rung a few of my friends, Robbie came round, Gilly came round, Adam came round. A couple of my real close friends and they rang Sporting Chance, who's an organisation for um, sporting players who that are going through going through a bit of a bad time. And that's when you then started getting that help. And yeah. what what was the main thing you took away from? What was the main thing that they, they gave you when you so started? we so from there yeah so from then being at my mum's uh, we're made to go we're kind of forced to go to, to down to Lipuk it's called Sporting Chance down in, down near London. Uh, and I did three and a half week course. So basically, what I can how I can describe it to you best is when I first went there, my first day, which they know you're not good, you're in a bad way. They said to you, Leon, how are you feeling? I go, yeah, I'm fine. Like and like, look at him like you wanted to bang him. So you know what I mean? Like, what are you, are you talking to, you silly prick? So Leon, how are you feeling today? Yeah, I'm fine. Like, There's nothing wrong. What's, what? What are you asking that yeah, for? Yeah, I'm fine. What? what? Right. So for the commit, that's my first day. <coughs> If I can fast forward that to, you, to three and a half weeks later, well, yeah, how are you feeling today? Okay, well, to be honest with you, I'm feeling a little bit anxious. Um, you know, I'm nervous about going home, but really pleased that I've been here. Really thankful that for the help that I've received, um, but just feeling a little bit, a little bit nervous inside. But you know, I, I do generally feel good, um, and I'm very, very grateful. And so y you go from being a closed book to realizing that you can open up. In front of people, and for me, that's the, probably the biggest help. The biggest help that I have is just being being a bit more open. Yeah. Sharing a problem, mm. not being a burden on somebody, not being oh, I've got more problems than you. Yeah. But yeah. just learning to talk. Yeah. Learning to open up, and um, obviously, I then have three and a half, four weeks of completely clean living, training, no alcohol, no, no, no pharmaceutical drugs, no drugs, no nothing, and you get clear clarity vision of listen why are you what you got to why are you so down you're living a good life you've got a wife got three kids mm. you're happy you know you've got things to live for and you, your mental state because you're so clean yeah. you're so healthy you get that perspective you back get your full perspective yeah. back um, to help redefine your purpose as well and understanding what you want from your life going forward as well i, I, I think I don't think it, what, I, I don't, it didn't give me no clarity going forward, but it made me learn the person I wanted to be. I wanted to be, I wanted to be a bit more of an open book. Um, I didn't want to be judgmental. I didn't want to, to judge people. I wanted to be really appreciative of everything that I've got. Because I think the only reason that can you get depressed is so you, you don't really appreciate you've got a life. You're healthy, you're living, you've got a good life. You know, a lot of people haven't got yeah. all those. No, things. they haven't. Yeah, no, yeah. I've got. You know, everything that I've got now is what I wanted at twelve year old. So what yeah. I've got to be down about. Yeah. You know, I'm not sad that it's over. I'm happy that it's happened. But it happens to so many people, doesn't yeah. it? And you know, do do you agree that um, more kind of men in particular need to acknowledge yeah. that there's nothing wrong with counselling and talking? No, because we're not. We we, bra we we are a macho. The thing is, rugby. We're a macho sport. Men are macho in the general. And we don't talk, and that is the problem. You know, it's weakness talking. It. We all think if you said to you, Ram, I don't feel great now, or so, I just feel a bit down. Well, that's a bit. You know, it's a bit like shut up, yeah. dust yourself up. But yeah, shut up. You know, yeah. toughen up. Yeah. You know, uh, but that's old school, isn't it? Of course. It and is. as we're evolving <coughs> now, we're starting to realise after the re you know the biggest killer, the biggest killer in males, I think, is between from ages of 21 to. 42 or something like that. suicide is male suicide that's the bigger kill biggest killer in the world and it's that attitude Bar that on. plays a massive part in it it's the single if you're not if reason. you're not strong mentally you know forget everything else but it, i was know. strong mentally and i brought and i brought myself yeah don't matter how strong you are yeah because there's no outlet no you can't um you can't constantly digest negative emotions and negative feelings if, if you're not if you're not thrashing it out yeah. or for, for me for me you say you know it's being strong mentally being strong mentally, we're not talking to anybody and just getting on with it. Yeah. That's strong. That was the strength. Mm. That's strong. Like, I am strong. And if you want to come with me, I can show you. I'm strong. I deal with everything. Mm. That, that's what brought me. Yeah. So it's not strong. No. It's, it's ridiculous. But it's not until you get to the lowest of the low that you realise that.
Yeah, that you, you, know, that you the, realize the, the reality is it's, it's the complete opposite. No, and I think, that, I think, there's a, I think the, the biggest thing is, like you say, the stigma that's carried with, carried with mm, masculine, you know, being a man and being macho. You've, you, people think you've got to be like that. And, and, and it just causes, for me, it causes me a, a lot of trouble in my own head. And the biggest, the biggest thing, and, I, and it's not this. What's this progression in myself as a person is not an overnight fix. No. This is this is probably, I'd say, after rehab and two years of two years of working on myself, on me, is um, is is, is progress. It, what when I say is, how can I put it? It's, it's being thankful. And being open, like just being really, really, I'm really thankful for everything. Got it changes my mindset every day. Perspective. I wake, perspective every day. I wake up and I think, thank yeah. you, thank you for what I've got, thank you. Um, and I've just, you know, and I have no judge. I don't, I'm not judgmental on anyone at all. No matter how bad of a situation looks, I try not to judge. Um, and the biggest thing is trying to love yourself, because for me, I was so bothered about what people thought in my life that I did my own. I didn't. But then I realised that no matter what you do, no matter how good you are, people are not going to like you. Completely. Yeah. Right? So you're going to be judged no matter what. Right, so if you are, <laughs> you're a sin and you are really, really good, people are not going to like you, Leon. Yeah. You know, if you're bad, people are going to like you. If you're good, people are going to like you. So why are you so worried about something you have zero control over? And once I started to actually, when I say this now, like, I do not give a fuck what people think. When I, when I say it now, I mean it. Yeah. But before... Yeah. When I say it, I don't get what people, I did. You did. I did. When I say it now, I generally mean I don't give a fuck what people think about me. And how freeing is that? Yeah, it's massive. But, yeah. but to get there, yeah. I had to love myself and I didn't love myself. And, and me being loud and being a joker was a mask for my massive insecurities about myself. Mm. And mm. I think you find that with people's, how you meet them, usually... They may be the opposite of how they portray themselves. Completely. So yeah, for totally. me, so for me, yeah. I portray this really confident, upfront, abrupt, you know, you know, easy, confident. But underneath, if you peel it right, right back, I'm just like, oh god, I hope he likes me. And I hope they think I'm all right, and I hope I'm not being, you know, I hope they think I'm an obhead. And oh god, and, uh, and, and, and you worry yourself. Yeah. You worry yourself. Yeah. Women worry himself to death. But, and I didn't like myself for that. And then you know, I was going through court. I went through court cases. And things where your name's in paper and you feel judged. After that, you judge yourself. And, you, and, and I didn't think good of myself. So if you don't like yourself, it doesn't really matter if anybody else likes you, does it? Mm, no. Mm, it doesn't really matter, does it? Yeah. I, I like myself now. Yeah. Like I like myself. I don't care what anybody else says. You've got to love yourself. And I think for a long time I didn't like myself. And, and, I, and until you like yourself, until you like yourself, it don't matter. Mm. You've got to like you, uh, like yourself. Like you said, that, that's taken you a long time to get to that position. If somebody's listening to this right now, that is literally at that lowest point where you were, what would you say is kind of the I don't know three tips you think are the main three things they can start by doing right now to be on that journey that you're speak that you're to on? speak to somebody first. The first the yeah. first thing for me is speaking to somebody. Yeah. Before it's too late, like don't. You've got to speak to me. If you can, if you just confide in somebody, even if it's ringing an helpline, if it's a doctor, if it's your friend, you've just got to try and confide in somebody that. Listen, I'm struggling. Yeah. Just talk. The first bit is talking. Yeah. Um. It's a it's a long process for me. I, I think the, the first one is just talking. That's amazing. The most important one is mm. to get it off your chest. And that don't and, come and, and that possibly don't for, for a lot of people, it's, it's actually acknowledging that this has to stop as well, because for people, they can just keep turning to the drink and that's the answer to everything. Yeah, but until, until usually, I think usually you got to bottom out. I, I, I think people, for me, I bottomed out before yeah. I was made to ask for help. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy for me to say here yeah, with this perspective of things being okay, but yeah. when you're in that rut, yeah, you just go in. You don't care. At what point do you think you need to recognise it? You know, like if if somebody kind of if he's, if someone's feeling what you're saying right now, and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm fucking on board here. I know, and yeah, I need to do that. And yeah, I'm I'm doing those things, and I'm being a little bit like this. What would you say would be enough's enough point? Well, I, I'm t if I said to, that, to seek. 
I, my enough's enough were being made to go to rehab, so I didn't have enough. I didn't have that. Yeah, as in it didn't I mean? come from you. It didn't come from you me. Were I, for, for, for me, were my supporting network. Yeah. It was my wife. They did it for you. It was my wife. Yeah, basically, my wife, my mother-in-law, my mum. They made me get the help because I didn't ask for it. My biggest thing is, if I could, if if I could now, in I, hindsight, in hindsight, in hindsight, what I should have done is gone. Listen, Carly, I am gone. Oh, I'm really, really struggling. Really, really struggling. But I couldn't get it out. I just think being able to talk, just being able to say, listen, I'm really, I know you, I was talking to Rammer on way down today and I said, listen, you know, things going, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit cash wise at the moment. I've made a really, really big money. Um, and now I'm, you know, I've gone back to part time. I'm not on this big, huge money that I've been on since I was 16, 15. I'm struggling a little bit. I wouldn't have said that to him 10 years ago, five right. years ago. I wouldn't have told him, I wouldn't have told him nothing. But that lightens the load for yeah. me. Yeah. I'm not trying to be down, I'm just confiding in a friend. Yeah. That that lightens the load. A problem shared is a problem half. Yeah. It's massive. That's the biggest thing, if I can say, is just not to be too proud. I were too proud. Well, that's what it is, isn't it? And I like were too said, proud. You don't give a fuck now. No. About image, about what people's no. perceptions are. No. Because well, I look, because I like myself. Yeah. Yeah. So if you like do. yourself, it doesn't matter what it is if you don't like you. Not the people are not going to like you no matter what you do. People will say negative stuff no matter what. People say this podcast is rubbish. Yeah, people completely. say what are you doing it for? Yeah, does it matter? No. Why does it? You know, then you might get another ten that say it's fucking fantastic. So does it matter about them? As long five? as long as it's helping some. But I'm saying, but I'm just saying for everything that we yeah. do. You judge that. I anyway. walked out of that door, you know, you can get him walking out there, cocky, cocky prick. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna get, you're gonna get slagged off, and people are gonna be negative, no matter what you do. Yeah. So why listen to them? It's only a reflection of them, anyway. Yeah, correct. That's, That's what I'm saying. It's only a reflection of where you are mentally. Yeah. yeah. You are personally. Shit, per- you're in a shit place. Yeah. You just need to dish it yeah. out all day. So, when, so when if I'm, so if I'm thinking, if I'm in a in a badly on, so a bad mood, I went, fucking prick. Okay, I'm like fucking like, that tight t-shirt because he goes to the fucking gym. Oh, so you think he is a prick? Yeah? That's what I yeah, think. Right, right. He's been listening. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> right? And then you go, and then you, when you're in a good place, Rama's looking well, he's tra- training hard, he deserves it because he sacrifices a lot. That's the two differences. And when people are negative, it's only because they're insecure in their own heads. 100%. That's it. It's, yeah. a, it, it's only yeah. a reflection of them. And when you can finally get there, you get to realise that your life's so much better. Yeah. Like my life now is so much better because... It's like a big deflate. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, you've... I, when I were doing really, really well, I realised that people were just jealous if they didn't like me. Yeah. I wasn't doing it wrong, but I were an 18, 19 year old kid driving around in a 30 grand BMW. Yeah. Cut that prick. Yeah. It, it's not, he's done well for himself. Go on, lad. Yeah. It's like that short enough prick. Yeah. Yeah. But when you realise it's just them, not you, you're all right, but you've got to go through the shite to get there, haven't you? Yeah. You know Unfortunately. I mean? Unfortunately. You're, you're, you're always you're just growing older, you know what I mean? If I, if I were the same now as I was when I was 21, I wouldn't have grown. I wouldn't have grown as a person. We're always growing and there's this, you know, this stuff now that I don't know that when I get to 30, when I get to 40, I'll be different. When I get to 45, I should have learned more. When I get to 50, you know, if I get there, hopefully you should be learning all the way along. We don't know, you know, our, our elders and mums and dads and granddads, they've lived it where we, we've got to get there. No, we don't know everything, do we? But you know, if I were the same person I were at 18, 19, then I'd have done something really, really wrong. Mm. You know. Do you feel like you genuinely look back and go, for that reason, you wouldn't change anything? Um, that you've learned from everything for um, the better. I, I, I think, I think if you keep on going back and wishing things are different, then you're going to torment yourself for the rest of your life. Yeah. I think what what I've learned is. The lessons that I've learned and the person I am now is because of the shite that I've been through. Yeah. You know, the court cases, the fighting, being in trouble, um, the silly stuff, the, the the drinking, the coming into your career. I've been through that, but it's only made me now who I am. Yeah. I don't believe anybody can go through life and just it'd be all ups. No, it's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, nobody yeah. can just have a buzz and be happy all the way through life. You've got to go through some shit. Yeah. Surely. You know. Yeah, hundred percent. Especially when it comes with a trade off of being in the public eye. Yeah. If if you're not in a position like that and you just sort of sat back, then you can make those mistakes because he's not on show. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not everybody's gonna know your business yeah. as well and that 
that's another torment in its own right. Really Everybody knowing your what business. you're up to yeah, yeah. and, and oh, well, being well, the talk. Well, you know? well, just imagine one year, one year driving through, you're driving Halifax Road, uh, and you know, and you, if you look outside, it's teen airports, teen airports, doesn't it? It'll say, Price going to jail. Price five years, looking at five years in jail. And you go up to Whipson, it's like 20, 21, and you know, the people go, fucking prick, and you're this, you're that. That sent me cuckoo. I mean, that sent me completely within myself, completely. Yeah. It's not normal, is it? It's not normal to have your name no. on, a, on a billboard, which is my own fault. You know, I'm not taking, I'm down my hands up to take responsibility. I'm just trying to tell you what happened to me mentally after it. Yeah. Because, you, you know, I don't ever want to ever share responsibility because it's me that did it and deserved it. But mentally, I'm just trying to explain the process that you go how through. How did you deal with that at the time? So we talk about, is this 2002? Yeah. You, you, I mean, at that time, you've obviously not been on I the journey you're on now. I didn't deal with you it. You didn't? I didn't speak to anyone. I basically went to my wife's, my, my fiance at the time, Carly, I went to her mum and dad's and just stayed indoors for a year. Didn't speak to anyone. Really? Yeah. I didn't speak to like Carly said that you didn't. I didn't. She said you didn't speak, Leon. So you sit down in Mum's house and not say a word for the whole time you were there. So we're obviously inside my head. I came to see you the next day after after one particular incident, and you were just like there, there were no one at home. Mm. And I was trying to talk to you, but it, you know you, you can't. I don't know. You just if you're not willing. If you're not willing to let it, so let if anybody, if anybody who's listening anyway, for, for the people that are listening, you know, I've been involved in a, a fight, a, a bar fight when I was 21, which I got done for grievous bodily harm, and nearly went to jail for five years, and then another incident. You know, we just tried to help a friend out, and we got done, we got done again, and look, I wasn't real jail time, but the first one when I was 21, I was looking at five years in jail, losing my career, my wife was pregnant with my first son. Um, that was bad. That was pressure. I deserved it because what happened, the fight in the bar and what have you, was, was bad. But, you know, it was, mentally took a, a hell of a lot out of me. Probably, probably ch that, that, that one incident changed my life. Mm, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think I ever were, not recovered, I, was, I, don't ever, I, and I probably never felt the same after that happened. Mm. Like, I've got real bad anxiety now, like, if there were like 20 lads and you were coming in here and it were absolutely heaving, Mm. I'd have anxiety coming in. Really? Yeah, I yeah. couldn't, I couldn't yeah. come in. So that's why I don't go to parties. I don't go. I don't go to big lads gatherings. I get really, really, really bad anxiety. I'll come in. I'll do ten minutes and I'll go home because, in my mind, just being around the situation that I might get into a any kind of confrontation or scrap, I can't, it takes me back there. Yeah. yeah. So I'll go home. Yeah. So that's why I don't go. Really go out. I'm really, really bad with it. So it still affects me to this day. Mm. I guess it would, mm. but moving on from all that, you know, you've you've sort of, you know, you've come through all that, worked on yourself, still working on yourself, still evolving, and now you're giving back by coaching the game that you love, and yeah. um, you're currently at work, <coughs> and uh, you've done well with them ever since you started. I think they were always like a mid-table kind of team, and you were yeah. in playoffs with them last year on your first year. You know, I'm not I'm not going to big you up too much because you're my mate, so <laughs> I'll give you a little dig off camera, but. No, you've done well, yeah. and you are doing Massive well. Respect. Um, you know, it's and it's it's nice to see that the success is still it's still coming for you. You know, because yeah. I can I can actually say that I've been coached by you, yeah. and you got the best out of me, yeah. without a doubt. What is success though? What is success for me? For me, success is only judged on by people within the rugby. From yeah, have you done well? I appreciate what you're saying. Is it success though? What is success to you? Your success and my success, what you count as successful, for me, you guys doing this and helping people, and me coming on here and trying to help people, that's as much as successful as it is winning rugby games. Yeah. Yeah. So what we count success in, it, it varies. No, it, I, I, I used to count my, me being successful. I could get on a, a driving game, on an arcade game, and I had to win. If I didn't win, and I want Leon Price, because Leon Price wins. Yeah. You know, how effed up is that? Yeah. A driving game, you know what I mean? Who yeah. cares? Yeah. Right? Success is only counted in what you think it is. For me, this, no matter what happens, if it, go, if it helps one person, it's successful. Yeah. That means you're successful, it means you're successful. It means I've helped a little bit in some of those successful. Winning rugby games will make you successful. Mm. It's good, because that's my chosen, chosen, chosen field. 
But in my head, I'm always going to win because yeah. I know I can do it. But it's not only that, it's, that. it's actually getting the best out of people as well. Yeah. And you, you can do that because yeah. I've had yeah. shit coaches. I don't doubt myself do you on know that. What I, mean? I don't doubt myself on that. But I just like to look at forms of success differently now. I don't just gauge it on me winning. Yeah. That's not successful. You know, me being, me being happy with myself in the morning, that's a success. Me not being a knob is a success. <laughs> it is. Yeah, Do you it know what is. I mean? Not doing something stupid that gets me into trouble <laughs> is a success. I've learned not to be a knob. Yeah. <laughs> that's successful. That's a, it's growing up. Still working on that. Yeah, well, I tried to. Yeah. It's true, though, anyway. People say, oh, I want to be successful. Being successful is a lot of baggage with it. You know, yeah, if, yeah. if it's uh, business, yeah. there's a lot of sacrifices. It's very, very selfish. You can be very on your own. You can be very, you know. And that's success? Yes. Supposedly. Yeah, suppose success. Supposedly, yeah. So, you know, Instagram why, for you know, Why would success. I want to be. I don't want to be that person. I want to be. Yeah. I want to be. I want to be. A little bit more open. I don't want to count my life on if I've. Am I? Am I? Have I am I good because I've won a rugby game? No, I'm good because I'm just trying to be me. You know, I, I, when I played rugby, we're all about winning and, and success, and you won trophies and that. And As you say, about you twenty were years. Vision, yeah, though, tunnel vision. Yeah, about yeah. twenty years of that, and it's yeah. like, God, I'm bored of that. Yeah, yeah. It's boring. There's a bigger picture now. There's a miles bigger. Yeah, there's a bigger picture. Just trying to be happy. Yeah. That's the key. I love yeah. that. That is the key. Before we go, we've got some quick fire. Yeah, quick we've fire some questions. People send in some questions, haven't we? So we want to give them a shout out. And Come on, man. Yeah, yeah. Come let's on, do man. it. So Jordan Turner, not the rugby league Jordan Turner, um, asks, what is it like going back to your homegrown club after so many years away from it? What were it like then, you know, yeah, we, going we, we, back we, to Bradford? It was good because, it was daunting, but it was good because you want to prove them that you that they shouldn't have got they shouldn't have gone that they should have made more effort to, to keep you um so it's good it's good when you're in that mind i mean we're only 23 22 23 then so you're really tunnel visioned and you you wanted to prove everybody wrong so it's daunting but you don't care that age you got you don't care as much do you like you don't think about it as much yeah. you just want to show her i'm the man i'm going to come back here and show everybody that they've messed up by not making sure they kept me yeah mm -hmm. yeah um Phil Ramsden, oh, Scalari, asks, who was your best coach? Uh, Dan, my dad, my dad was my first coach. Um, God, my relationship isn't very good with him at the moment, but you know, he's taught me a lot, taught me discipline. So, you know, what, everything that I'm doing now with working to, and everything that I did with you, was only what my did, dad did with me. You know, so the discipline side of things, being you know, trying to get people on your side and, and being in bed, clean your boots, be smart, turn up on time, um, you know, do things right. When you play, everything that my dad taught me well, is only what I do now we're working on. The, the intricacies of, and, and the, the smartness of playing rugby is from my, obviously my professional coaches. Yeah. But the, if I had to tell you my coaches, I'll be what my dad taught Foundations. me. Foundations. Yeah. yeah, nice. Um, Adele Hunter, you used to go to school with her. I don't know if you remember Adele, but she says that you used to have a Nike tick earring mm. and she really wanted it. Yeah. Do you still have it? If I so, might, can I, might I have, have it? it in my jewellery box, yeah. It, I think it might be in my jewellery box. You should have put it on. I'll put it on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it on and send you a photo of it. Get, get down <laughs> with the kids. I have it in my, uh, my jewellery box at home. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. Right, we need I'll it. I'll have a look. Get it in. I'll have a look. Um, I have a question. Your funniest rugby tale. Do you have one? Can you think of a time, uh, either locker room time or um, end of season do or something where you have a tale that stands out in your mind that <sighs> were a funny time? I don't know. I don't believe really, it's really sound good on camera. Because <laughs> I usually tell these, I tell, when if I tell these, I usually do them for my um, after dinner speeches and stuff. Okay. So. Um, so anyway, save it, save it for a, for an after dinner speech. What like this if, one? If if listeners uh, are interested and they, and they live locally, because obviously M, uh, the M62 corridor is a predominantly rugby league heavy sort of yeah. channel, and if you're living in those areas and you listen to this and you want to hear some it's some good I, some good bands, my twenty years is some crazy crazy stuff. You know, I'm most of it anyway. Yeah. You, you know all the tales, but I've met and played along some absolute maniacs. <laughs> 
And when I say crazy, I mean completely and utterly crazy. Like Nick Fozard. Nick Fozard used to wank in his car, on, on, in the car. So we'd get Yorkshire bus, I'd be driving. Right? <laughs> Yorkshire. I'd be dri Yorkshire bus, I'd be driving. We'd pick Kyle Eastman up. Kyle Eastman's really homophobic. A little black guy. Don't like any gay kind of stuff. You know, not homophobic, but don't like, you know, touching yeah. each other. You know, don't like that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Foz is the opposite. So we'd sit Kyle next to Foz, so Foz would, <laughs> Foz would take his top off, start tweaking his nipples. Like, oh, God, I'm so horny. And then, like, he gave cock out and start wanking, you know, just joking. I'd go, go on, Foz, go on. And, go, and then Kyle would go, ah, ah, screaming. And, and then, and you know Foz, you know Foz. He's a crazy guy. And, and we'd torment him with stuff like that, like, once a week. On, on the way home. <laughs> yeah. But it forms you. He makes, so you speak to Kyle now. I mean, Kyle's just... Kyle's played for England Rugby Union, he plays at Leicester, he's a multi-millionaire, he's loaded, he's really, really successful. You speak to him now, that kind of stuff shaped him. Yeah. <laughs> you speak to him now, they're, they're his best memories. Yeah. Getting the auction balls, coming over with us when he were a kid. Shit in his pants. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, it sounds really bad, but that, that kind of stuff is rugby banter. You yeah. know, it's, it's just, that's what we do. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, yeah. we used to have these sliding doors at St. Helens, so if you... Slight doors back that were just like ibuprofen, strapping, um, all, everything you need for in physio room. But there were about that much space behind it, so what he did, he did, got one of us to tape him up, <laughs> fully, full of tape around his mouth, round chair, his arms around, around a, a chair, and sat behind these, say these uh, the screen doors. So physio's coming in the morning, open door, gone to the thing here, and open, open. He just sat there going, <laughs> naked, naked, <laughs> sumped at cherry cock out. <laughs> uh, stuff like that is just, uh, it's priceless, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's what you miss. When you retire, you don't miss rugby, you miss stupid shit like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is. It's like banter central, isn't it? Yeah. Leon, yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure. Tell, and I really feel like some of the stuff you've, you've talked about there, First of all, thank you for no, talking about that stuff, and and hopefully people can relate, people can take something away from that. Um, Even if it's just one person. Absolutely. If it's one person that listens to this and and, and it helps them, and you've done, we've done something good. Hundred yeah. percent agree. If if anyone wants to catch up with you online and sort of where where do you most hang out? Is it Instagram? Is it Facebook? Where? Um, I'm on twi Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. I try to stay off social media as much as possible because that does you in as well. Yeah. But uh, Instagram and and and, and Twitter. We can get me there any time. Brilliant. Yeah. We have a final question, don't we? You've, you've ha I think you've sort of answered it, but yeah. it might be good to reflect and maybe reiterate. Do you want to ask him the final question? Right. Leon. Surprise. <laughs> Surprise question. Surprise. Let's get naked. What is your definition of success? What's my definition of success? Being happy. That's it. That's it. If you if you if you're happy. It doesn't really matter, does it? I mean, you can you can have what we were talking about the other day. You can have ten million pound in bank. If you're not happy, mentally happy, it doesn't matter how much money you've got. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. I think for me, finding happiness, you've succeeded in life. If you can find some way to be to be happy with yourself, yeah, to be happy, yeah, find happiness. And it's not just an extrinsic thing. It's not things no. that you can find outside. No. It's just no, inside. It's not, it's not, it's not, yeah, it's, 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 it's not money, it's not uh, things, it's not um, wealth, it's not um, it's not things, it's not cars and that. For me, it's, you know, being happy and being happy with yourself. You know, you might have 10 cars and you've done really well, but that makes you feel happy and you're, well, you're happy. You've got 10 cars, it makes you feel happy, good. Or you've got nothing, but you've got your wife and kids and you're happy, good. Yeah. You know, just be happy and for me, that's being successful. Is that you find some happiness. Yeah. Love that. The best things in life are free. Leon Price. No Ladies and gentlemen, no respect. No yeah. Cheers, Leon. No Thank you so much for listening to today's Rich in Success episode. If this episode has impacted you, there's a few things we need you to do to help support the show right now. Please spread the word. Tell a friend that you think needs to hear our message and subscribe to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher or Google Play. And please give the show a five-star review. Don't forget to also like our social media pages and tag us on your Instagram stories. Your support means the world. Thanks again and let's keep growing together.